this morning, 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. Here's what Paul tells us. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise also, that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, and love, and holiness, with self-control. I'm well aware what passage I just read to you. (laughs) We come this morning to one of the most contested, perhaps debated is the word, in the entire New Testament. In fact, more academic and pastoral literature has probably been written on this passage in the last 75 to 100 years than many other texts in the Bible combined. So as we approach this text, here's what I'm asking you to do as I have been praying and asking myself to do all week, that we approach this text as we do with every text that we preach through with humility And with joy. But number two, that we also remember the context in which Paul is writing. And as we have said every week, Paul is writing to Timothy as he remains in the church at Ephesus to faithfully teach the church and also to refute false teaching to both the men and women in the church at Ephesus that had crept up. Now, God values both men and women and their roles in the life of the church. And because he values them, we should live out those instructions that God gives to both men and women in this passage today. But specifically in this passage, here is what we learn. Three truths that I want to share with you. Number one, men, we are to pray sincerely. Women... You are to clothe yourselves with godliness. And then number three, women, and I could really say, and men, are to submit to the teaching and authority of the pastors or the elders. Those terms are used interchangeable. Number one, men pray sincerely. Number two, women, clothe yourselves with godliness. And number three, women are to submit to the teaching and authority of the pastors and the elders. So let's dig in this morning. I've never had a group of people stare at me more intently than with this passage. Here we go. Number one, men, pray sincerely. Now Paul begins his remarks here in verse 8, which actually connects with what we talked about last week. Remember last week we learned that we should be praying for the salvation of lost people. And he connects those prayers with what he encourages the men to do here in verse 9. He desires that in every place the men should pray lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Men, you should be leading the church. In this way. And as I begin to reflect on what Paul is teaching here, I actually begin to think about how, generally speaking, in the life of the church, women are the ones leading the way in prayer, not men. Why is that the case? Now, praise God that we have women in our church and in every church that I have been a part of that have stepped up and held the ministry of the prayer of the church together. But what Paul is teaching here is for the men 
to be the one who are praying sincerely. They are the ones who are to make the concerted effort to lead the way in this regard. It seems as in our context here that the men in Ephesus were not making prayer a priority. This is why Paul tells them to pray sincerely. And when they did pray, not only were they not making it a priority, but they were doing so with impure hearts with anger, with quarreling amongst themselves. Praying with impure hearts is really no more effective than not praying at all. Lifting holy hands that Paul references here. It's not necessarily a command for all of us to raise our hands every time we pray. However, there are a number of postures in the Bible that are perfectly appropriate when we gather and worship. Perhaps you are comfortable raising your hands. Perhaps you want to get down on your knees. Perhaps you want to lay flat on your face. Now, even though we don't see that happening here from week to week, no one is stopping you from doing that. Feel free to pray however the Lord leads you in His Word to pray. Lifting holy hands is the reference that Paul uses here. Paul is not, however, most concerned about the physical posture of prayer, but the spiritual posture posture of prayer and apparently that was the problem in Ephesus the men were approaching these times of prayer with their hearts not in the right place so the question for us men is when we do pray what kind of attitude are we bringing before the Lord are the relationships that we have with one another characterized by peace because that was not the case in Ephesus If not, have those relationships been reconciled? Do we have any unconfessed sin that is hindering our prayers before the Lord? In the context of this passage, the men of the church were coming to prayer with division and anger in their hearts. Perhaps even division and anger over some of the false teaching that was taking place in the church. But nevertheless, Paul says, men, when you approach prayer... You should pray sincerely. When we gather the first Sunday of every month to partake of the Lord's Supper, this is why we spend so much time confessing our sin before the Lord. Because we know that sin hinders our prayers. Jesus himself gives us a similar teaching moment in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 5, 23 and 24, here's what he says. If you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Now in the context of Jesus' teaching, he's probably thinking in terms of a financial gift. But the point he is making is that the purity of our heart trumps whatever spiritual act we might be bringing before the Lord. The ritual doesn't matter if the heart is not in the right place. And this is what was happening in Ephesus. This is what can happen to us. Whether it be praying, whether it be singing, whether it be the offering that we bring, whether it even be the sermon that is preached. If our hearts are not in the right place, whatever that spiritual gift that we bring before the Lord is, it is not what God desires. So men, specifically men of this church, let me encourage you, lead the way in praying. Lead the way in praying in the life of your family. Lead the way in praying in the life of your community groups. Lead the way in praying in small groups just around the church. Do what Paul is telling the men of the church to do. Lead the way in confessing sin. Lead the way in reconciling broken relationships. Lead the way in purity of heart and mind. Lead the way in encouragement and in service. And do it for the sake of the body of Christ. Do it for the sake of our sisters in Christ. Do it for the sake of the next generation of young men who are desperate to see godly men professing their faith in Jesus, praying, praying and leading the way. Women have been doing it 
for far too long. And praise God for it. But it is our job to lead the way in this way. There's no reason to wait to do this. You don't need my permission to begin praying. There's no program that has to be implemented for you to gather with a group of people in the life of the church and faithfully pray, faithfully confess sin together. It doesn't need to be some big event. It doesn't have to come from the pastors. Pray sincerely because the Bible calls the men of the church to do so. Step up. Be the men God has called you to be. And as I say this, I'm preaching all of this to myself. So I'm not immune to anything that I'm saying to you this morning. Men, pray sincerely for the building up of the body of Christ. This is what Paul is telling to the men in Ephesus. And this is the application that still applies for us today. Number two, women, clothe yourselves with godliness. So in the same way... Paul says that the men are to pray sincerely. Paul instructs the women of the church to clothe themselves with godliness. Now, before we even get into this, you need to understand an important rule of interpreting the Bible. And here is that rule. You need to understand the difference between the principle that is being taught and the application of that principle. And this is going to become really important in our text moving forward today. In the context, in Ephesus, some women were dressing elaborately. They were fixing their hair. They were wearing fancy jewelry. This type of behavior in Ephesus, Paul says, is inappropriate because it was a distraction during the gathering of God's people in worship. So for the men, the distraction was coming to prayer, having anger and division in your heart. For the women in this passage, the distraction is the way that they were presenting themselves. That's the application of the principle. But here's the principle that we need to heed. And it comes in verse 10. But with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. So the clothing and the jewelry and the hairstyles were not the principle. They were the application of the principle which Paul makes clear in verse 10. That women are to clothe themselves or profess themselves with godliness. Paul is not saying... That all women in the church must roll out of bed on Sunday morning, show up with no makeup, dirty clothes, disheveled hair, and unbrushed teeth. In fact, I am certainly not God, but I would prefer you not to show up that way. I'm all about teeth being brushed, a mint in the mouth, looking normal. Okay, I'm all for that. So please don't take what Paul's saying here as some sort of, you know, return to Mother Earth type of living. If you want to do that, go for it. But that's not what Paul is actually talking about here. At the same time, however, if the preparation time to get ready for church and the gathering of God's people is distracting you from actually either being with God's people or having your mind and heart in the right place to gather with God's people, then it's potentially a problem. Now here's what makes this text so challenging. External beauty in the eyes of the world always trumps internal beauty. Always. Those that are in the limelight that get famous, that are celebrities, generally speaking, are praised for their external beauty. So what Paul is saying to the women in Ephesus here, and which applies to all women today, runs against the grain of our culture. And men, by the way, we don't reinforce what Paul's teaching here when all of our focus is on the external beauty. Men, if you're married, or guys, if you have girlfriends, 
we are far more prone to point out the external beauty in the lives of our significant others than we are in the internal beauty. We're very quick to point out when they have a pretty dress on or they look nice externally. But how often do we praise them for their purity of heart, their kindness, their gentleness, their love for the Lord and His church? Hugh Hefner, the founder of Playboy, should not be a cultural icon in our country today. But why is he? Because we have promoted external beauty. We have celebrated external beauty to the point that it has actually been watered down. So, there is no rule about what you wear to church. There are certainly not going to be uh, men as you exit today examining you to make sure that you're not in violation of having braided hair or wearing jewelry or dresses. But the focus is Paul wants, not only, not only did he want the women in Ephesus to do this, but women today for the focus to be clothing themselves with godliness. And we as men have a responsibility to encourage and foster that godliness within the lives of the women in the church. And it doesn't matter what men that you work with, ladies, say about you, or what the guys at school say about you, even the way your dad or your grandfather might praise you for your external beauty, and many of those things are done in sincerity and with kindness, but if we're not careful, we can neglect the things that God actually desires. The beautiful things that he has created internally within the lives of the women of our church. One commentator, as I was studying this week, offered a helpful question that I think would be beneficial for all the women in our church to ask. He says, sisters in Christ should not be asking what makes me look the most attractive. That's the wrong motivation. Instead, the question should be, what can I wear that best demonstrates a humble heart devoted to the worship of God? Now, will this question be easy to answer? No. Will it cost you something personally? Perhaps. But I do know this. When your time on earth comes to an end, we will all regret things that will happen in our lives that we've done. But one thing that no one, man or woman, will ever regret is the steps that we take to clothe ourselves with godliness. Those are eternal riches. You are Sisters in Christ, you will be rewarded by God for your faithfulness, for your holiness, and for your growth in godliness. And just know that even as we approach very challenging texts like this, that your brothers in Christ in this room will pray for you and make it easier for you to heed the instructions that Paul gives in this passage. So men... Praise the women of our church for their growth in godliness. Encourage them in the areas that increase their holiness and their love for Christ. In the midst of a generation, in the midst of a day when women are almost exclusively praised for the external beauty that they bring to the world. Number three, women submit to the teaching and authority of the pastors and elders. Now Paul has, if you'll notice, two instructions for the women in this passage and only one for the men. I can't give you the answer why that's the case. So don't be mad at me because it's two for women and only one for men here. You'll have to take that up uh, with Paul one day. Nevertheless, again, 
Let me take you back to what we said earlier. We have to be able to separate the principle being taught from the specific application of that principle in the text. And he gives this instruction to the women specifically in Ephesus, but it also applies to women today. Now, since this is a very tense and emotional passage of Scripture, let me go ahead and lay out on the front end what Paul is not saying here to put people at ease. Number one, he is not saying women cannot speak in church. Learn quietly, which is the phrase that he uses here, does not mean complete silence. In fact, if you were to study the whole New Testament, you will find that in 1 Corinthians 11, chapter 5, Paul gives specific instructions to women as they pray and as they prophesy in the church. Therefore, this text is not teaching that women should never talk. Okay? The text is also not teaching that women should never teach. How do I know this? Because of what the New Testament teaches. In Titus chapter 2, verse 3, Paul tells older women to be teaching younger women. 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 3, they reference Timothy's mother and grandmother who faithfully taught him the truth of the gospel. Acts 18, 26, Aquila and Priscilla pull Apollos to the side and more accurately explain to him the ways of God. Matthew 28, 19 and 20, the Great Commission does not just apply to men. It applies to men and women. So we have tons of occasions throughout the New Testament where women are involved in teaching. Colossians 3, 16, both men and women are to teach, it says, and admonish one another. And in all of those passages, we see women teaching. So do not leave here today thinking that God has not used women throughout the life of the church to teach. Nevertheless, God has uniquely designed men and women to have what we call complementary roles in the home and the church. This view has become known as complementarianism. So let's take this passage verse by verse and unpack what Paul is teaching. Paul says, let a woman learn quietly with full submissiveness. Now we already established that quietly doesn't mean never to talk. Paul is talking about a quiet demeanor. The women are learning, and Paul says that as the women learn from the teaching of the pastors and the elders, they are to learn with a quiet demeanor, in contrast to one who would refute, argue, constantly ask questions, and prefer to hear themselves talk rather than humbly receive the information that is being communicated. So as the women learn quietly, they should do so, Paul says, with full Submissiveness. Full submissiveness to who? That's the question. Is it Paul? Is it to the gospel? Is it to husbands? Is it to all men in the church? Is it to a select few men within the church? Remember the context. Since Paul is writing instructions to men and women within the life of the church, it is a reference to those in authority within the church. So who is in authority within the life of the church? Look at verse 12. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. Now we already, again, established that this is not a blanket prohibition of women teaching in general. In addition, I also don't think Paul is teaching here that a woman can never under any circumstances instruct a man. However, the role of authority in the church has been designed by God for men. 
and an expression of that authority in the church happens to be the teaching of God's Word. So Paul is saying that women should not have authority in the church and thus to teach rather than remain quiet would be a violation of that God-given authority that he has given to pastors and elders who are to be qualified men, which, by the way, we will teach on next week when we get to 1 Timothy 3. So to sum it up, Paul is teaching that pastors and elders of the church have been reserved for qualified men, according to 1 Timothy 3, and that the women of the church should humbly, graciously, and joyfully receive that teaching for their good and the building up of the body of Christ. But men, by the way, you are also to submit to the elders and the pastors of the church. So even though Paul doesn't give explicit instruction to the men to do this, the men are also called to do this. A healthy church is one where the congregation joyfully and humbly receives the authority of the pastors and elders that is expressed in the teaching of God's word week in and week out. So even though in this specific passage the focus is on the women of the church, men are also to submit to the teaching of the pastors and elders. And guess what? Pastors and elders are also responsible to submit. No one gets out of submitting. Listen to what Peter says. Pastors have a responsibility to lead appropriately. Here's what he says. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 2 to 4. Specifically written to pastors. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Pastors and elders are not to manipulate. They are not to coerce. They are not to bully people into doing what they want to do. If I were to go around the room right now, all of us either have personal examples or people we know whose pastors and elders violated what Timothy, excuse me, what Peter is teaching here. In chapter 5, they domineered over those in their charge. They bullied them into doing what it is that they wanted them to do. When I first came here four years ago, having no lead pastor experience, I thought that just because I was the pastor, people would do what I wanted them to do. Now, that was incredibly ignorant of me, but I didn't know any better. I was young and foolish, still am in many ways. But the more God has uh, shaped me in his word and shaped me through valuable counsel, what I realized is that if the people are not following you, it's because you're not shepherding them. You see, in order to get God's people as pastors and elders where we even want them to get, Even if it is biblically, if they're not ready, then we need to shepherd them. We need to faithfully teach them God's word. And continue to faithfully teach them God's word. And teach and teach and teach and teach. And over time, the more we faithfully proclaim God's word and faithfully teach them what it says, perhaps some of those that we're not convinced will become convinced. Not because of anything that we as the pastors said, but because God's word changes hearts. It's the word of God that does the work. 
So when pastors and elders try to manipulate or bully or coerce people into doing what they want to do, even if it is what they believe God has called them to do in His Word, if they do it in a way that is inappropriate, all it proves is that the people have not yet understood what God's Word says about that issue. And so you continue to faithfully plod along. So pastors are to submit to the leadership of Jesus and His leadership for the church. And to do so in a way that loves and shepherds the congregation to get them where they need to be. Even if it might take longer than what the pastor and elders would like to see happen. Because we're not on my timetable. We're on the Lord's timetable. And he knows the growth that the church and the trajectory of the church needs to be on in order to get where God's word wants it to be. Now, all I've done so far is give you the answer to this passage. But Paul is much wiser than that. He's much smarter than that. He doesn't just say, women, submit to the teaching of the elders, amen. No, he actually roots his argument in God's word. And he takes us back to Genesis 2. He roots this vision for men being pastors and elders and women submitting to the leadership of the pastors and elders, he roots this vision in God's word back in Genesis 2. So let me sum up some of Genesis 2 for you because we don't have time to read it all. Here's an overview of what happens in Genesis 2. Genesis 2, 7. Man is formed. Genesis 2, 15. Man is put in the garden to keep it and to work it. 2.18 and 2.21, God realized that Adam needed a helper. Now this is very important. Adam did not realize that he needed a helper. There is nowhere in Genesis 2 where Adam complains about being by himself, complains about being lonely. God realized Adam needed a helper. That's important, women, because it shows that you have tremendous value in God's eyes. You have also been created in the image of God. We have no mention that Adam was lonely, that he was depressed, or not able to function. But God knew that Adam needed a helper. Genesis 2.22. Woman is created from man. So Eve is created from Adam. And then Genesis 2.24, man clings to his wife. Why does Paul use this illustration here? The fact that Adam was created first signifies the headship of man in the created order. The order of creation is God, Adam, Eve, and they rule over the beasts of the ground. Now notice what Paul says. Paul says in this passage, Eve was deceived, not Adam. Paul is not saying that Adam isn't guilty or that Adam didn't sin. And if you want to go read Romans 5, believe me, Paul blames Adam for a lot of things. But in this passage, Paul says Eve is the one deceived. So what Satan actually accomplishes in Genesis 3 in the fall of man is a distortion of the created order. In Genesis 3, the order of the fall is as follows. Serpent, Eve, Adam, and God. God has been moved to the bottom in Genesis 3. But in Genesis 2, he was at the top. So Eve is deceived by Satan because Adam has failed in his role as the head. And in that moment when he fails in his authority as head, Eve steps up in his place and is deceived by the serpent. He abandons his authority. And the story of distorted authority in Genesis 3 ultimately leads to sin. God has designed man to be the head 
of his house. And that's a good design. And that example is now used to make the same argument in the life of the church. The authority of male eldership, male pastors, and headship within the church is the good design of God. And Paul roots it in the created order in Genesis 2. Now, I fully recognize that as I say things like this, there are other Christian denominations who come to different conclusions on this very passage. And this is not an issue of salvation. So we have brothers and sisters in Christ who we could partner with in many, many ways who would disagree with our understanding of this passage. But I think, and Baptists historically have believed, that Paul's example of the created order in Genesis 2 reinforces the application that he brings to bear on the church in Ephesus. So women of the church... Let me encourage you to submit to the leadership of your pastors because God designed his church to function in this way. Now look at verse 15. It's another very confusing verse. What Paul is not teaching is that women are saved theologically through childbearing. That cannot be true. We know that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. In addition, there are some women who are not able to have children. Therefore, there's no way Paul could be saying here, you are only saved if you bear children. But Paul uses the illustration of childbirth to further illustrate the point that when a woman operates within her design, and part of that design is to bear children, she will be saved through that. Now again, not all women have children. Not all women can have children. Not all women get married. And Paul celebrates singleness in other of his writings. So if you are a single man or woman in this room, I want to celebrate you and say God can use you in a way that he often does not use married men and women. You are not second rate, brothers and sisters. You have just as much value in the kingdom of God as our married brothers and sisters. So don't be discouraged in any way. But this argument is simply used to help reinforce Paul's argument from the created order in Genesis 2. And part of the created order for women is that they will, in fact, bear children. Aligning with the roles that God has designed for women means, Paul says, that they will continue in faith, love, holiness, and self-control. You do not have to have children To be saved. You do not have to be married in order to be used by God. But when women operate within the roles laid out in Genesis 2, within the created order, it is evidence, Paul says, of their perseverance in the faith. So this morning, I want to encourage men and women in our church to fulfill the roles that God has designed for you. Men, be the head of your household. Lead, protect, provide, and sacrificially serve your families. If we operate within the instructions that God gives to us, it will reinforce the instructions that God gives to his church in this passage. Women, Affirm and support the leadership, if married, of your husbands. Nurture your family and serve your church with the gifts he has given you. And if you're not married and if you don't have children, then you can still operate within God's design for you as a woman by faithfully submitting to the eldership and the pastors of your church and faithfully serving your church according to God's good design. When men uphold their headship, and women 
uphold the submission to the church of Jesus Christ and within the lives of their families, it accurately reflects the teaching of Scripture. And the more we align with the Scriptures, the healthier of a church we will be. Every part of the body, man and woman, pastor, elder, has a part to play in this passage. And the beauty of Genesis 3.15 is that it is through the seed of a woman that Jesus comes. And in Genesis 3.15, we are promised That through the seed of woman, one is coming who will crush the head of the serpent. And his name is Jesus. That was promised in Genesis 3. It was fulfilled in the first century. And now anyone who places their faith in Christ Jesus is freed from the punishment and power of sin. Our hope is in Christ. And when we function men men and women in the way that God has designed for us to do, we build up the body of Christ and we promote the gospel into the world in a way that they so desperately need to see it. Let's pray. God, we all leave today with clear instruction that you have given us men of the church, women of the church, even pastors of the church, all given clear instruction in your word about how we are to function within the life of this body. So it is my prayer that we would humbly and joyfully receive this teaching and that your Holy Spirit would do the work of planting these truths deep into our heart so that we can more faithfully serve you. And most importantly, we thank you for Jesus and his love for us. It is in his name we pray all of these things. Amen.